My name is Greg Baptiste. Behold the Lamb Ministries International, where we're changing lives one life at a time. Tonight, we're going to finish up our series on 12 things that are holy to God that should be holy to us. And this is the fourth one, which is the last three. Amen. Uh, you know, we talked about it. I'll kind of brief you a little bit on it. The, the number one uh, was you are holy to God. The Bible says in 2 Peter, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we should show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Now, we're called to reflect God in everything we do. And so we are to live sacred and holy lives before the Lord. Amen. Uh, he didn't say that. He didn't tell us to do something that we didn't have the ability to do. He gave us the Holy Spirit, who is the one that came to walk alongside us, to strengthen us and to give us the ability to live right before our God. Uh, but it's a choice. Everybody has to make a choice that they want to do what's right in his sight. And so if you're called out of the world to be a, a example, then you are required to live a certain lifestyle, uh, a chase lifestyle, a, a way of communicating where you watch what you say, walking circ circumspectly, not as fools, but wise, understanding what the will of the Lord is. When we walk circumspectly, we're careful how we live because people are watching our lives. Uh, we ought to be a good example to people so they could follow us into this covenant that we've established with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, number two is life. Human life is holy. And the reason why I say that is because God said in Genesis, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. Uh, so he created us in his image and his likeness and he gave us the ability to be just like him. Uh, with that being said, God said that human life is holy, whether it's in the womb of a woman or it's in the prison cell. We don't honor God's life like, like he does. But, but we need to begin to consider that people have been created just like him and created in his image. And so I know we get disgusted with people. Sometimes they rub us wrong and we look at them like the scum of the earth. But they are still God's creation. And we need to be mindful so that we can be conscious how we treat people, how we speak to people, how we love on people. It's important that we love each other. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that said, this is how you know that they are my disciples because they have love one for the other. Now we may not always agree, but we could tend to disagree. We could agree to disagree, amen? Mm -hmm. And not fall out, right? We ain't gotta fall out because I don't believe what you believe or, or, or vice versa, amen? Uh, number three is marriage is holy. You know, the Bible says that marriage is holy and the bed undefiled. So God has called us to live a certain way. If you want to be intimate, then you need to be married. Praise God. Uh, we're not talking about the kind of marriage that the world ordained. The marriage ordained by the world says you live together for a certain amount of time and then you're accepted as married. No, this marriage I'm speaking about is a covenant that God established. It's the first institution for mankind. God put a marriage in place so man and woman could come together and be joined together in holy matrimony, holy matrimony. And so that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a marriage between a man and a woman. I'm not talking about a marriage between uh, two of the same sex. No, that is not God's ordination. God ordained a husband and a wife, a male and a female, praise God. And so marriage is also holy in, in the eyes of God, and it ought to also be holy in our eyes. Number four, sex is holy. Uh, I know you don't know that sex is holy because it's not holy to you. But let me say this. When you come into a covenant with Almighty God and a relationship that is established by the word, it becomes holy and sacred. And so, uh, it becomes intimate, uh, but by the Holy Spirit, God makes it sacred and holy in his eyes. Uh, in the world, no, it's ugly. 
because we don't respect one another and this is just something to do. But when you understand why God put it in place, uh, that two, those, those two shall be one. Amen. When they come together in that type of holy union, it's holy before the Lord. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a sex that is holy and sacred in the eyes of God. Amen. Number six, the tide is holy. Uh, God. God set the tide in place, and that's Old Testament. We live under a new covenant now. Uh, the Bible says you are to give to the Lord as the Lord has prospered you. But tithing is an ancient key to the kingdom wealth. And, and so the tithe was a disciplinary program that God put in place so that we could honor God and he could have a right to bless us. So he doesn't need your money. He doesn't need it because the Bible said the gold and the silver is the Lord. The tithe is the Lord's and uh, the cat on a thousand hills is his, but he put it in place so that he could train us on disciplinary. Uh, because if you could put it to the side, as, as he spoke in his word, then, then he's training us in discipline. See, he doesn't need our money, but he needs our discipline. So tithing is a disciplinary program that God put in place so that he will have a right to bless us, amen? Number eight, the word of God is holy. God's word, this is his holy word. I, I think I shared the story about my little nephew, uh, my little cousin who had a, a fire took place in their apartment. And everything in the place burned down, even the nightstand where the Bible was at. But the holy word was untouched. That, that's the hand of God. But this is God's infallible word. This word is holy. It will change your life. I, I've seen it, it go from the gutter to the other moves, touching lives and changing people's lives. When they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ with a redemptive revelation, when they get in the word and the word gets in them, it changes everything. It, when, you, when you get in the word, you begin to renew your mind. I promise you, you think different. You, you move to a whole nother dimension. But it's, it's only when you receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to change your life. Amen. I said engrafted word. That means the word gets down into your spirit and intertwines with your spirit. And you begin to change who you are. The Bible says that the word will come in by revelation and cause a transformation and then become a manifestation. So, you know, when you get the word, when you get the redemptive word, when you get a revelation word and, and it, it begins to penetrate your life and you put it down in your spirit, it'll change who you are. It'll change everything about you. And, and that's what God's intent was for us to receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our soul. What does that mean? That means we won't think the way we used to think. We've been trained to think a certain way, but the word will come in and change the way we've been trained to think. That's what repent means. It means to turn around and change the way you've been trained to think. Pull down that government that controlled your life, that teaching that kept you in bondage, that teaching that was not accurate according to the word of God. We've been taught a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily accurate. But the Bible says the word will come in and break the fallow ground up and open your eyes to the truth. So that's what Paul's talking about when he said, I pray that your eyes of your understanding be enlightened. God wants to open our eyes so that we can see his intent for our lives. Do you know that God has a plan for every one of our lives? That, that, that even in the book, it says, I know the plans I have for you in Jeremiah. Plans for good and not for evil to give you a hope and then expect it in. God has a plan for our lives. And he wants you to understand that he didn't bring you here by accident. You, you didn't come here by coincidence. You came here on purpose. And purpose is the original intention of a thing. It's the thing, it's why the thing was created. So most of us will go through life and not know why we came if we don't come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be like me and a couple of guys decide we're going to go down to Florida and we're going to travel all the way down there. We're going to drive down there, get down there, and, you know, forgot why we came or why we went. That's what it would be like if you came to earth and never find your purpose. 
Uh, the only way to find your purpose is to seek the one who gave you life. God is the only one who could show you your purpose. I mean, man can give you some ideas of what your purpose is like. We can give you some indications of what, what you're called to do. I could tell you one of the things is whatever you're bothered by, you're called to change. That's, that's a part of purpose. Now, number two is if you're passionate about something, it, it's a part of your purpose. Uh, those are two things that indicate what you're called to do, but most of me, you need to get before the Lord so he can show you why you're here. Remember, you didn't come by accident. You didn't come by coincidence. You came on purpose. Number nine, the church is home. And that's why God has called us. He said, come from amongst us and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. God wants to present a holy church, a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. How's that going to happen? Well, first of all, everybody in the body of Christ has to come to a place where they understand that we are one member of many and that we are one of each other. So listen, when the hand hurt, the whole body hurt. Mm -hmm. When your head hurt, your whole body is affected. When I stub my toe, it affects my whole body. And so we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And I said, well, you know what? I know he ain't got it together, but neither do you. Mm -hmm. Too many times we look at other people and say, oh, they need to get it together. Well, listen, before you start sweeping by somebody else's door, mm -hmm. sweep by your own door. Before you go to take a, a moat out of somebody's eye, get the bean out of your own eye. Yeah. It's important that we look at ourselves that we become better people because we're looking in the word of God. The Bible said looking in the perfect law of liberty and continuing there. That means as we look in God's word, we see what we ought to be. It's a measuring rod. And we can see where we fall and show that. And so the Holy Spirit will come and he will help us get where we ought to be. But let me say this to you. You need to be encouraged today because God has given us all the tools we need to become successful and to live right in his sight. God is not withholding any good thing from those he loves. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. What is prosperity to you anyway? Is it finances or is it a closer walk with the Lord? Is it walking with the Lord? Let me tell you why. Because when you're walking with the Lord and you're consistently communicating with him, Things are opening up for you. Doors are opening that no man can close. When you start walking with the Lord, there's no need to have finances because God will provide it as needed. That's why I say if he gives you vision, he'll give you provision. We don't have to beg about give this, give that. I, I don't even believe that. Uh, you know, if God gives us vision, he will give us provision. And God wants to provide for us. God wants to do the miraculous in our lives. But we got to walk upright before him. And we've got to communicate with him. We've got to spend time with him. We've got to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. He got up early in the morning, stayed, got far enough away, and stayed long enough. And you know what happened? The disciples went to find him because he got lost in the spirit. Amen. But we need to get lost in the spirit. See, when you get lost in the spirit, it becomes about other people. See, it ain't about making a living. It's about making a difference. What kind of difference are you making in the lives of others? Or is it all about you? Oh, well, listen, if it's all about you, you need to change your perspective. It should be about everybody else. And when one hurt, everybody should hurt. You know, I have a good friend of mine. What we do is... Uh, one of the guys we do his lawn, he lost his son. And I was talking to him uh, on the phone. I was just giving him my condolences and telling him I'm praying for his family. And I, I began to tell him, you know, I said, listen, you know, uh, we're going to bring some waters and sodas and whatever else you need. And he was like, no, you don't have to do that. And I said, yes, I do. I do have to do that because I've got to serve mankind. That's our job is to show them the Lord Jesus Christ in everything we do. It's about somebody else. It ain't even about us. Mm -hmm. See, when you get the revelation that it ain't about you no more, you stop being a, a sparrow black. 
throwing you fits and all that when you can't have your way. See, our, our problem is we lose focus on what it's really about. It's really about other people. What are you doing to change the lives of others? Uh, most importantly, how are you living? The example that you set so people can follow. It's important that we change lives. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten mm -hmm. son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, mm -hmm. but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. God is not willing that any should perish. Our main focus should be sharing the good news with people who are dying and going to hell. Sharing the good news with people who are lost and can't find their way. Mm -hmm. That's our job. We are the light of the world. We are light distributors. We should bring light everywhere we go. I, I had my, my boss to call me the other day and told me to come in the office. You want to talk to me? I said, well, you must be in the array. Because <laughs> I know it, it can't be nothing bad. And so what he told me is he said, listen, I need your help. I said, well, what you need? He said, listen, we got a survey coming. And I need you to use your influence on the coworkers so that we could get a good, good survey. And I said, well, what make you think? I, he said, because I watch you and I see what kind of influence you have on people. And I'm not asking you to go out your way. I'm only, only asking you to be who you are, but just be mindful that the survey is coming. <laughs> I thought about it when I went out the door. I said, you know what? I said, that's a good thing that he sees. Mm -hmm. When people see something like that in you, that means you are doing something right. How many of your neighbor come and say, neighbor, look, I was wondering what you pray for. Praise God. You know, the neighbor knows one thing. She's a praying woman. Amen. Yeah, people ought to reach out to you. You know, you cut in head. The man said, look, bro, I'm having a little sick situation. Can you pray with me? Yeah, of course I'm going to pray with you. You're going to believe God for the miraculous in your life. That's what it's all about, sharing the good news, sharing God's love, sharing his goodness every chance we get, and, and, and letting people see our light. Praise God. Number 10. When I stop that. Yeah, 10. A holy covenant. Praise God. Let's go to do the round. Would you turn to do the round with me? And, and let me just share a little bit about covenant. What covenant is, it's an agreement between two people that binds both parts to fulfill their obligation. And, and so a covenant is binding. And that's why Abraham and God had this covenant. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about how God says, listen, Abraham, everything you have is mine. And everything I have is yours, even to your life if I require it. And, and so we know that God, uh, Allowed Abraham to have a child after many, many years of believing God. Amen. Uh, Abraham was 100 years old when he finally had this child. This child, Isaac. And I'm not talking about Ishmael. Ishmael was a good idea. It wasn't God. It was good. But Isaac. And then God asked Abraham to go and offer up Isaac on the altar. And the reason why he did it is because he had to make sure that the covenant was intact. See, remember, the covenant meant everything you have is mine and everything I have is yours. So he had to prove Abraham to be faithful to the covenant. So he asked for Abraham to offer up his son, Isaac. And Abraham was willing to do so. As a matter of fact, he took his son and went up to Mount Moriah where he was going to offer him up. And the Bible says he even lifted up the knife to him, kill his son. When a, a voice came from heaven and said, don't do it. Now I know. There was a stamp that came from heaven that said, validated. Praise God. Because Abraham was willing to offer up Isaac. It gave God the legal right to offer up Jesus. Praise God. That's how powerful and binding the covenant is. This is a holy covenant because it's his holy word. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. But I'm going to read it to you. In Deuteronomy 7, um, I'll start at verse 6. It says, you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. 
The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all the people, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep his oath or his covenant, which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And he repays those who hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack with him who hates him he will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which I've commanded you today to observe them. This is a holy covenant that God has established. Marriage is a holy covenant between a husband and a wife when they choose to enter into a relationship that binds both of them to live a life, a long life, faithful relationship and devotion. They work as partners to reach the common goal, like building a family or raising children. That's a covenant book. God honors his word. He honors his covenant. And we're in covenant with God. And, you know, I, I love the way God operates because he watches over his word to perform it. You know, I've been through a lot in my life, and, and sometimes I really didn't know how God was going to take and move. But at the end of it, God always showed up and showed out. The Bible says, listen, that God is looking. He's looking everywhere for somebody who he can show himself strong mm -hmm. on their behalf because their hearts are perfect toward him. Amen. I mean, I, I, the devil tried to take everything I had, but God showed up and, and gave me twice as much. Always moved on my behalf. And I thank God that I understand that he's a covenant-keeping God. And that when you make a decision to live for the Lord and you live right before God, God will always intervene on your behalf. He will always move on your behalf. Dude, don't, don't you think for a minute that you've done all this for God and then God leave you hanging. He'll never leave you hanging. The devil is alive. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. And God knows way ahead of time how things are going to turn out. See, you can't try to figure God out. You got to see him in the figure. Amen. You got to see him in the figure. You got to get a revelation. Amen. You know, you could stand on the word because I understood the covenant. See, Abraham understood the covenant. He understood that God promised that Isaac was going to be the for uh, was going to cause him to be the father of many nations. So he knew that if Isaac died, then God had to raise him back up again, or God became a liar. And so, when you understand the covenant, you don't know how it's going to happen, but you know it's going to happen. Praise God! I, I didn't know how God was going to deliver my son out of trouble when he got in some trouble uh, because they had just made a new law. But I do, I did know this. I didn't know how he was going to do it, but I know he's going to do it. <laughs> and guess what? That's all I had to hold on to. That God, I have collateral in heaven. And you said in your word that you would honor your covenant. And I'm standing on the word. And like I said, in the natural, it doesn't look good. But in the spirit, I know you got my back. Praise God. And that's exactly what he did. He came and showed up and showed up. Amen. 11 is holy communion. Communion is holy. Uh, Jesus said, uh, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, God wanted us to be reminded of what he did on the cross, how he sacrificed his life so we can have life and have it more abundant. And he told us that when we take it, that, that we need to be careful how we take it. Because some people even drink damnation to themselves because they do not count the Lord's communion as holy. So I'm telling you, he says some are sick and some even sleep because they does not discern the Lord's 
body. So we have to have the right attitude when we're taking communion, but communion is holy. It's holy because it represents his body and his blood. And when we partake of it, it's healing for our bodies. The communion is greater than diabetes. It's greater than glucophage. It's greater than insulin. And when you get a revelation, when you get a revelation uh, of who he is and what he did, and you get a revelation of what communion is, the power of communion will change lives. It'll bring healing. It'll bring deliverance. It'll, it'll break chains off your life when you understand how powerful communion really is. When you drink the cup, when you drink his blood, it'll deal with your blood. It'll go into your bloodstream and deal with stuff you didn't even know was there. That's how powerful, holy communion, holy communion. And when we take it, we need to be mindful. Of it. Now, that's why we don't let everybody take it. We make sure that they check their hearts. We make sure that their lives is in order because you don't want to drink something that causes damnation to you. Uh, we want to make sure that we do it in such a way that God honors it, basically. And the last one is the Holy Spirit. Lord knows we need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is the thing that makes us holy. It's the person, the third person in the Trinity. It, it, the Holy Spirit is the one that checks you when you're about to say something you shouldn't say. The Holy Spirit is the one that pulls you when you're about to go somewhere you shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. God knows we need the Holy Spirit. And how many times we yield to the Holy Spirit? How many times we deny mm -hmm. and not listen and do just what he said not to? But, but, but we have to learn to walk with the Holy Spirit and let him lead and guide us into all truth. God knows we need the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Look, let's go over to John 14. The Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. Since I didn't go to many scriptures tonight, I just kind of talked a little bit about everything. But I, let's go over there, John, the 14th chapter. And uh, we'll read a little bit, 14 and, and 12. Uh, and th this is talking about what God wants to do in our lives. But it says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Listen at this, though. If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you comfortless. I'm going to leave you a helper. A paracletos is one sent alongside to help. See, when I get in situations where I don't know what to do, I just stop and say, Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit will impress on me, my next move. So we need to learn to trust in the Holy Spirit. He will lead us and guide us into all truth. He says, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. See, the world can't receive the Holy Spirit because they don't see him and they don't know him. But you know him. And you need to learn to trust in that small, still voice that's constantly wooing you to do what's right. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Now, that word means I will not leave you spiritually unprotected or totally vulnerable to the power of Satan. I will not leave you unfunded. I will not leave you unsupported. Praise God. Amen. Thank God. I will not leave you unfunded. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a mouthful right there. I know you don't know how things are going to go for you right now. Things looking real glim. But, but I'm, let me tell you something. They're looking real dim. But I'm telling you now, 
He says, I will not leave you unfunded, unsupported. Praise God. That's for somebody. Unsponsored. Mm -hmm. You may not know how your finances is going to turn out, but I'm telling you, he says, I'm not going to leave you unsponsored. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Wow. Somebody need to grab that. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to support you. I'm not going to leave you vulnerable to the enemy. I'm going to protect you spiritually so that you could do all I've called you to. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. He says, I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You will live also. And that day you will know that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and make myself known to him. Praise God. I will love him and make myself known to him. Listen to this. The Holy Spirit is with us all the time. But you know, the Holy Spirit is a gentle. He's not going to push his way into your life unless you invite him in. See, a lot of times we think he's just going to push his way. And no, he's not going to do that. But if you let him, he'll come in. And he'll lead and he'll guide you into victory. Amen. No one thing. He's never going to leave you. Never going to forsake you. Jesus says, I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the world. When we go through our darkest times, he's there. I'm sure you've read about footprints when the guy says, listen, I found a time in my life when it was so dark and I didn't, I didn't see but two footprints. He said, yeah, because I was carrying. See, you thought you were walking on your own by yourself, but I'm never going to leave you unsupported. I'm never going to leave you alone. I'm always going to be there with you because I love you and I've born you for this day and this hour. And I've got great things that I'm going to do in your life. And so I want you to understand that those 12 things were holy to God. And they should be holy to us. I don't know if you took notes, but we'll, we'll go over them one more time. You are holy. Human life is holy. Marriage is holy. Between a man and a woman. Sex is holy. When it's under God's covering, it becomes beautiful, intimate, intimacy. See into me. Amen. Sabbath is holy. That's a day set aside to worship God and to honor God. The tithe is holy. The name of God is holy. The word of the Lord is holy. The church is holy. The covenant is a holy covenant. Communion is holy. And the Holy Spirit will make you holy. Twelve things that are holy to God that should be holy to us. My name is Greg Baptiste from the Older Land Ministries International where we're changing lives one life at a time. This temple is holy. We are the temple of the living God. And, you know, just recently I was having this conversation. I was saying that we don't treat this temple like it's holy because of some of the things we put in it that, that makes it defile. We need to be careful what we eat, what we drink, what we smoke, because I promise you this, this is God's temple. If you put something in there God can't deal with, then you're going to make him leave. So it's important that we understand we are the temple of God. Hallelujah. We are the temple of the living God. God dwells in us. He walks with us and he will speak to us. I don't know if you've fallen away from the Lord or maybe you've never met the Lord in the corner of your sin, but if you want to pray, I'd like to pray with you. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died and went to hell so I wouldn't have to go. 
I believe he took my place. He became my substitute. I accept the sacrifice that he made on the cross for me. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Lord, from this day forward, I'm going to follow you. Give me the Holy Spirit so I can follow his lead. Plant me in a good church where I can grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. From this day forward, I'll never be the same. Amen. If you want to sow into this ministry, we'll set up with Givelify. Also, we have a cash app. It's dollar sign, Behold the Lamb Church. And we gather together every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock at 1520 Albert Street. 1520 Albert Street, 9 o'clock in the morning. I promise you we won't hold you long, but I guarantee you we'll make you strong. God bless you. God keep you too, ladies.